Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and the honor to speak after Keith. <laughs> the DNA stuff is really interesting. So, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, my talk will be on, uh, on solar conversion. I'm a solar guy. <laughs> And I've been battling for the last four decades, <laughs> okay, but still going on. And so I, I like to, first of all, uh, take you through a journey, the journey which uh, led us to the invention of mesoscopic solar cells, diasensitized quantum dark solutions. Finally, this technology gave birth to the path guide solar cells, which are about to beat silicon. How about this? <laughs> and it's molecularly based. So, um, yeah, so uh, it all started when, um, I, as a young student, I, I couldn't decide whether I should study chemistry or physics. And so I, I, I signed up in, in, in one city for chemistry and the other for, for physics. But I like Berlin better than, than mine, said Jody. That was the chemistry thing. And so I was fascinated by uh, the, our natural environment. So chemistry tells us a lot about how things happen in nature. And that was the infatuation which I took with photosynthesis. Because photosynthesis is uh, the uh, life-sustaining process on Earth. Without photosynthesis, we wouldn't be here. You guys wouldn't be here, okay? And so... Uh, so yeah, so and then there's the reverse process of photosynthesis. How is that called? Fixation of CO2 to form sugars. Now, if you burn sugars to CO2, how is that called, that process? Respiration. So these two reactions, just one reaction that goes forward and backwards. That's what makes life go, respiration photosynthesis. And so at the time when I was... Uh, a postdoc in the United States, I was fortunate to get a, uh, a stipend from the Petroleum Research Foundation, PRF. And uh, they had asked me as a condition for the stipend to work on my cells. I didn't know what a my cell was, but I accepted. <laughs> okay, so so uh, finally, it uh, turns out that my cells are surfactant aggregates. As you know, they are the simplest mimic of a, a biological membrane, in a sense. And uh, so I was, uh, I studied photo-induced redox reactions in my cells. That's what brought me to the so solar conversion. And uh, yeah, and then in 73, the Yom Kippur war broke out. And uh, at one time, I... I went home to Berlin, I couldn't fill out my car because there was a shortage of fuel. And I started thinking, how much fuel is actually left on the earth? And, and so you know, it turns out that there was a 50 year kind of peak and that has happened, the oil peak has happened. 50 years was correctly predicted. And so, um, yeah, so then, uh, so that all uh, led me to think that actually we should be uh, making hydrogen from sunlight. That was a, a clear-cut uh, idea. And from water splitting. And I wasn't the only one. And this, is, this was and is the holy grail of, uh, of photochemistry or chemistry. Turn water into hydrogen and oxygen by sunlight. And so, uh, yeah, fascinating reaction. Almost an obsession with people, okay, to get that reaction going. And sometimes you need that obsession to, to get forward, to overcome uh, the uh, many obstacles that are on the way. So, so yeah, so the uh, inspiration came from, uh, from, uh, from photosynthesis. And uh, I'll tell you in a minute how we uh, came from that to the diasensitized. I mean, so I think you all know that photosynthesis uses a molecular absorber, not a semiconductor. It's not a PN junction device. And uh, so, uh, so this is a mimic of the light reaction photosynthesis, produce electric power. Now, it is, does the leaf also produce electricity? Are there charges flowing in the leaf? Correct or not? 
Of course, yes. It's a photoelectrical device. And so, so uh, yeah, we'll see the similarities in a minute. And so this voyage took us then from the simple laboratory invention. And today we have the applications. This is a uh, uh, electric car charging station in Switzerland. And uh, it uses a green dye that has a, um, a very similar structure to chlorophyll. Not, not quite the same. It, we have uh, developed it. We have modified it, molecularly engineered to become a powerful sensitizer. And there was this, uh, if you like, evolution or new revolution in, in the, uh, the Perskite's quantum dots were used to sensitize TI2. That turned into a huge field on its own. In the last 10 years, we have seen uh, 11,000 publications. From two publications in uh, one of, the, one of them was our publication. <laughs> and uh, in, in 2012, we are now running 1,500 per year. So if you want to read all of those, you have to read five publications per day. Good luck. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that's becoming a huge uh, effort. And uh, perovskite mania is a, is a term that has popped up. And these cells have also the possibility to be light emitting. And they are now over 25%, getting very close to the best single crystal silicon. Yeah, so uh, first let's talk to, about our motivation and uh, inspiration. And how, was, how did we come up with that approach? I mean, I uh, discussed yesterday about science, science and scientific ideas. They don't come overnight. And so very often research is uh, curiosity driven. You just do things out of curiosity and then all of a sudden, ah, you see, <laughs> Eureka thing. And, uh, and you find something. So you have to have the gift also of observation. That's very important to have a, the eye has to discriminate what is important and what is not important. And I, I doubt whether computer is as good as our mind. In, because many screening tests in our field have been useless because it's too complex to, to, to interpret the result. Computer makes errors, tells us the wrong thing. Uh, so as a conclusion, the measurement is correct and we have all the statistics, but sometimes computer doesn't tell us the right answer. So at the time when I was in the, U in the US, they, this is what one family would consume, okay? <laughs> In, ter in terms of uh, oil barrels per, per year. And, and this has come, gone up now uh, to, uh, well, uh, today uh, worldwide energy consumption. So every second, 1,800 barrels of oil equivalent are consumed. It's huge. You count every second. You count until 10, you have 18,000. So uh, that's terawatts. So, uh, 18 terawatts, so, we, so that was one concern I had, but then the new thing popped up. I should tell you actually, when this was in the 70s, we had the oil shortage because of OPEC, and, but then there was an oil glut. I started working on the water splitting in the 80s, and I said, well, we should work on the solar water splitting, and so my group turned to this topic. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah. And so in 84, we had a conference in Paris. I was invited as speaker. They couldn't even pay the train ticket for me. This whole field was broke, okay, because the oil price had gone down to $4 a barrel. Okay, today is $60 or $70 a barrel. And so, uh, yeah, so no interest. And I was surviving. I was one of the few survivors, the last Moican, so to say, <laughs> only very few. And, uh, and uh, with one graduate student who was paid by a private friend from England, we had set up a, a company, hydrogen solar, and so it was an incredible time. But, I mean, we survived with our project, and, but it, 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 it occurred to me that uh, it would be maybe a better idea to make photovoltaics first, because it's less challenging, and electricity you can always use, and so, um, yeah, so, 
So that, then there came in 88 another conference in Chicago where the uh, DOE announced there was a, a climate problem. And they, they told us, you guys, you see the end of the tunnel now because we will be funding you. <laughs> Not because there is an oil shortage, but because we have the climate problem. And, and so this is the from pollution, climate change, and a real threat. It's a real threat to life on Earth. Uh, the temperature going up. I just read that we are now at 420 ppm CO2. So this curve is going up, going up. So uh, it's uh, unabated. And uh, this is the uh, deep water thing. Uh, it's, uh, I was in Cancun a couple of years ago, I had won a prize. And um, so I was fortunate to be invited to Cancun. I'd never been there. Beautiful hotel, the beach that we're going to go swim in the Gulf water. I wasn't thinking about this <laughs> accident anymore. And when I got out of the water, boy, I mean, I had all tar and oil spots on my body. It was disgusting. I had to go through a detarring station. My body was a micro emulsion. I had to treat my body to get rid of all the oil. So this thing is uh, pollution is still there. It's uh, it's a terrible thing to happen. So, yeah, so that's uh, the climate change pollution. Even in Singapore, this, uh, now, where did the pollution come from? <laughs> I, I won't comment, okay? <laughs> I would just say neighbors, okay? <laughs> yeah, you, this is also in Singapore, and uh, terrible stuff. I mean, couldn't go outside. And so, so, in a nutshell then, I mean, the energy consumption will go up, that's the shell scenario, and the shell scenario is called, uh, oh no, sky scenario from shell. It's, uh, it's an analysis based on the Paris Climate ag Agreement. And so, so what do we have to do to maintain the temperature rise at two degrees in the next 50 years? Okay, that's what that whole study is about. And so, uh, well, I won't comment on these pie charts. I mean, as you can see right away, today we have mainly fossil fuels, and in 50 years, this will be mainly renewables. And the PV has to go up by a factor of 200. That's, that's, an, that's a short uh, story. 200 times more PV. And so we have to scale up from presently. Presently, the... Uh, <laughs> Installed capacity is uh, 0.5 terawatt. That's the peak. That's the peak power. Install so peak power. The so average power is 0.1 terawatt. There's not always the sun on the panels, and so 0.1 terawatt scale up. So we have got 0.1 terawatts to 20 terawatts, and uh, so that will make this impact. You can see on the pie chart. So, yeah, so how do we get to 20 terawatts? Well, for the synthesis, it produced 95 terawatts. So, so that's, that's the reaction I was mentioning to you. For the synthetic fixation of uh, CO2 and uh, the respiration. And, and so that's very, very interesting process, which inspired us, the green leaf inspired us. And it's based on a molecular absorber, these, for, uh, these chlorophyll molecules. And so here we have then the dye sensitizers we developed. And uh, so, uh, uh, so we use molecular sensitizer. And uh, this is called uh, electron selective contact. So when the dye gets excited, you want to selectively extract electrons, not the positive charge from the dye. So in the dye, you have a charge transfer, in, in, um, intramolecular charge transfer. And, uh, so then you extract on excitation, you lodge the electron from the lowest orbital to the lowest occupied to the lowest unoccupied orbital. So now a hole is in the, if you like, in, the, in this LUMO orbital and the HOMO and the electron, the LUMO. But you only want to extract the electron, not positive charge. And that's the TI2 does that for you because it has no levels available for the hole to inject. So it's a selective conduct. You don't need in a PV cell a PN junction, okay? You don't need. 
The PN junction is redundant history. We don't need it. You just need two selective contacts. And, and uh, at least one, because once the electron is out, well, the hole, we have to move it to the uh, back contact. And this can be done by electrolyte or hole conductor. So, uh, yeah. But when I was embarking in this field, everybody told me, you're, you're wasting your time, because the thing didn't work. Okay. And so, uh, so the, uh, the fundamental studies had shown this post to be extremely inefficient. And so here's a charge injection by sensitization, a large band gap semiconductor, same process I just discussed. And uh, actually, Michelle Bailey, she is a professor here in, uh, in Singapore. She's uh, at the Create Building. And so, uh, so yeah, so this. Uh, now, just look at the scale. We are producing nanoamps, so that's 10 to the minus 9. So nanoamps are produced. But uh, a solar cell in sunlight should produce milliamps, 20 milliamps, 40 milliamps silicon per square centimeter. And so we're missing a million, a factor of a million. That's a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so that thing doesn't work. And so when I was a student, I said, I want to do sensitization. Uh, the, uh, or postdoc at that time, our mentor said, Mike, you're wasting your time. Think about something more useful, <laughs> OK? And so but we came from a totally different angle. We didn't want to sensitize single crystal electrodes. We had been working on, uh, let me just first show you the sensitization. This is the injection, and then. You collect the electrons, and uh, you have to shuttle the electron back to the dye to regenerate it. Okay, so it's excitation, and we do it one more time. Excitation. Oops, now I have to go forward. And so our approach was a different one. We we reproduce the very poor results on the single crystals. Uh, here, efficiency is less than 0.1 percent. Well, that's the incoming photon to electron conversion efficiency. But then just look at this. Uh, here is this uh, nanocrystal film. It's, this is an array of oxide nanoparticles instead of single crystal electrode. Wow, I mean, get 90%. We got 10,000 times higher counts. Okay. And uh, so, uh, of course, the response is larger, and we get about 1,000 times more efficiency. And so how did we get to that? Well, we were playing around with, with nanocrystals for a while. We had been uh, doing uh, just curiosity-driven fundamental research on the dispersion of those oxide nanocrystals in liquids. Excite them with a laser pulse. You can study the electron transfer reactions. Nobody could do that. We were forced to do that, forced to make those particles, forced to do these fundamental studies. So we knew how fast the electron would cross the interface, how long the electron hole pair would live. And uh, finally, we also said, well, let's study the sensitization of those particles. Why not? I mean, let's just uh, play around. And so we came up with a sensitizer that has the anchoring groups that, that attach it to the surface, the carboxylates. And first paper published in 85. And so what did we find? We said, well, Efficiency so far with such those has been disappointingly low. That's what I just told you. <laughs> Mainly due to poor light or energy or small yields for charge injection. We have achieved strikingly high efficiencies. So these particles actually, they work differently. They would, uh, you would inject and the charge separation would be sustained for a long time before the electron would come back out. Recombination was much slower than injection. And so then we built uh, our first device. We used those nanoparticles, just an array on a conductive support to extract the carriers. We, we, had, we felt that we had a chance to get the carriers out before they recombine. So here's our sensitizer, our particle array. We would sensitize it just by dipping in solution. And uh, here's our, our electromicroscope film of the nanocrystal film. And so that was the approach, and uh, we studied also the 
dynamics and uh, injection very fast, regeneration microseconds. And then here is the critical thing. Electron transport, can we, can we take the electrons out before they recombine it? So you need to be 100 times faster with the transport than recombination. And that can be achieved. It's a, it's a matter of, of engineering the interface and the die, but many systems deliver close to 100% today. So over 99%. So, and so we, we, we finally came close to the natural system by using this array of, of uh, colloidal nanoparticles, they are called today, and uh, sensitize those. Uh, that was the trick. And, and why, how does nature do it? How does nature solve the problem of light absorption? Well, when you see the green color, it doesn't come from a monolayer of chlorophyll. It comes from the chloroplasts. They're stacked. Stacking of thylakoid membranes here we're stacking nanoparticles, so we, 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 we kind of mi mimic this, uh, this, uh, this approach as well, the, nat the nature's concept. So then the, the a paper was published with Brian in, in Nature that got a lot of citations uh, because it was the first paper that reported on a three-dimensional junction in photovoltaics. And uh, that, that, that was true. Everybody else was believed in PN junctions, and it had to be single crystal and flat and so on. But that was wrong. N nature uses disordered systems. Of course, the PN junctions work, but, but it's a different approach. It's a totally different approach. So here's a picture of Brian and at a conference in uh, Uppsala. And uh, then we took a patent out. and. Uh, Many thousand partners have been taken since then. Not by us, it's too expensive, but the, by the industry worldwide. And in, this is our first cell, and you see it has a, this was our working electrode. This is what I presented in Chicago, okay? And uh, at that time, our paper was published in JAX, and I was visiting the University of Texas at Austin, and uh, the chairman took me aside and he said, Mike, um, you're still young, so you have made a, we know you have made a mistake. We, we can't reproduce your work. And uh, so I said, well, how come? Did you try? Yes, I tried. Nobody can reproduce it. So. But you're a rookie, so we will forgive you, but don't do it again. So I said, <laughs> so I, said I said, I don't take anything back. I have my electrode with me. I used to travel with, we always be questioned, people not thinking that it wasn't true, because, I mean, we are like 10,000 times higher photocons. And so, uh, so I asked the student to set up the experiment, and uh, so here's my electrode. I dip it in dye solution, I color it, and I asked for the electrolyte, and put it on the, on the uh, voltage source, and then as I turned the light on, and whoom, I mean, they, they caught it almost. <laughs> <laughs> exploded <laughs> because the columns were so high. And uh, so Marianne Falk, who's a good friend of mine, she was there, she observed it, and she said, Mike, you really got something interesting. And so, uh, so this was our first experiment, but meanwhile, see, this whole thing has taken off and some flexible cells, and uh, this is one bag that you, you can purchase with you. My sister, she walks around with this bag in the desert. She always has a, her battery charged by sunlight. And uh, I gave one to, to Bill Gates when he invited me in 2012 to talk about solar fuels, really, but he was very interested in this uh, keyboard here and, uh, and wrote me a nice letter. And today, actually, a few years ago, he set up a $1 billion fund for solar fuels as a result of the, the visit and his visit also at Caltech. And he also made a very nice uh, comment in, on the Paris Agreement on the, uh, the dye-sensitized system. And this was another, uh, one time we were running out of, uh, out of bags. The company didn't produce enough. And so then uh, our president calls me. He said, Al Gore is coming. I need a bag. I said, we don't have any. They were out of bags. And, 
And he said, well, don't you have one? I said, yes, uh, please give it to me. <laughs> Al didn't know he was holding my back. <laughs> and uh, this is the Geneva banker who generously gave him my back. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so there are many applications now also in the building, uh, glazing, these are bifacial cells to collect light from from, ang from uh, all angles, and uh, this is our center, Congress Center in Lausanne. And so, yeah, so today we, we're engineering new sensitized. This was the Orthidium complex. And now we are, we're working on donor acceptor dyes. I just give you a couple of, of examples. This is, uh, uh, this is computer supported, so it's computationally supported. You can, uh, today the codes allow you to predict what the color of your structure will be. And so that's very, very important. And, uh, and so we came up, for example, with that dye. It's like a porphyrin. It has a, it's, a, it's a porphyrin, uh, like chlorophyll, and has a donor and acceptor moiety. It looks green, and, and uh, it has a high efficiency. So these, uh, these are the computations we had called the mechanical calculation. So we are heavily involved also in theory and work with theoreticians to to save time in the design of new powerful sensitizers. And these are some, I've showed you already the application. This is a sound wall, sound barrier. It's a motorway between Bern and Zurich. So the green panels have, uh, have great, uh, what should I say, resonance with the clients, with the customers. And, and so meanwhile, we also change our redox system and, so the idea is not perfect. I mean, it's, it's the regeneration, the, match, the matching is poor. So we get low efficiencies. Low means uh, not more than say 10, 11%. But recently with a copper complex, you see this copper complex, we can use solid state and liquids, the electrolytes, they are much better matched. And so voltages have gone up. See, the voltage of your cell is just the this is our level in the TiO2, the Fermi level under light, and this is the Fermi level in solution or in the solid. And so this 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 red dye, this red arrow shows you the maximum voltage. And so here's a solar cell, but they're very very efficient in, in ambient light harvesting. And so uh, yeah, so uh, so the, we could even beat gallium arsenide. In, in ambient light, if I use here a solar cell or in daylight, diffuse daylight, like we have a lot here in Singapore, you can, uh, the, the, these dye-sensitized systems give higher efficiencies, up to 35% conversion efficiency. All this is documented in publications and you can find on our website if you are interested. And so then there's also solid state version, which. Uh, which does away with the uh, electrolyte, no more liquids, it's a whole conductor. This was published first time in Nature also in, uh, in 1998, and it became actually a building block for the, for the perovskite solar cells. Even today's best uh, perovskite solar cells still use the spiral whole conductor <laughs> and TiO2. This is the whole selective contact, and the TiO2 is the electron or tin oxide electron selective contact. And so let's talk about this uh, pulse guide briefly. So here we go from these beautiful DSCs, disensitized systems, to the dull <laughs> but very efficient pulse guide systems. Okay, and uh, they look black because they absorb across the whole spectrum. And with a dye, you can take special domains of the spectrum. So you get all these color options. You don't have that with a semiconductor. And so, yeah, so named after Lev Porosky, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, there's a German uh, paper from Stuttgart that introduced those metal halides. The, uh, the, the earlier Porosky's, they used oxygen. X was oxygen. And so the metal halides are special. They, they are visible light absorbing, the oxygen ones are UV light absorbing. And so here's all the, the good news about these pulse guides. And the bad news is you use lead. So that's a 
that's not good. We have to deal with that issue. Okay. And uh, so, so, so I, I, earlier, who, who, who came up at what time, with what idea in the early stage? I wrote a commentary, and, and I, 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 I think I did justice at that time. Very carefully, it was refereed X times, and finally everybody agreed it was the correct account of what has happened, okay? And so, uh, so and today we see this rising curve, efficiency is over 25%. I mentioned to you over 10,000 papers, 11,000 in, in August this year, or last year, so it's already going up higher. And here's our theoretical limit that every PV cell has. A single junction cannot give you more than 33% uh, conversion efficiency. And as you see, it went up from 3% to almost 10 times, I mean, eight times up in this very short, this is a stunning rise, which has completely, uh, uh, what should I say, dislodged <laughs> the photovoltaic community. And everybody started working on perovskite solar cells. And so, uh, and they're simple, see, if I go back, they just have the path guide and two selective contacts. No PN junction, Keith. No PN junction. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> so, uh, but you can also make a silicon cell with collective contacts. It's a, so you don't need a PN junction. So silicon is not that. Silicon can also be used in such a configuration. And so you have the electron selective contact, the whole selective contact on top. That's all you need. And then you have a, the two contacts. One is gold, well, today we use carbon. Uh, ITO is a transparent uh, conducting glass. So, so uh, yeah, so, uh, so the, uh, the, the special feature about Postcard is they have a uh, undebonding valence band. Usually, uh, Take silicon, the bonding orbitals, or the valence bands, the bonding orbitals, and conduction band, and the bonding. Not the case for perovskite. Both the valence band, conduction band, and the bonding. And so, what does that mean? I mean, you break a bond, say the halogen, uh, the halogen lead bond, it doesn't produce a defect in the middle of the band gap. So, they are the total defect tolerant. All these cells are solution processed. I just paint them down. And so, uh, yeah, and so the, uh, so here's our silicon, and this is the post guide world, but, but you can see the complexity. This covalent electronic conduction, here we have mixed ionic electronic, and uh, we have this structural variety. You have all these anions you can use, cations. And these are the so-called A cations, cesium, formidine, methyl ammonium, guanidinium. They have to fit in the cavity, so there's a size restriction on those. And so the so-called Goldschmidt rule. And uh, then you, have to, you can go to two-dimensional systems that are quantum valve structures. Very interesting. Soon we will discover topological effects on those systems. I'm sure. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, for example, this was a photo effect of ion contact. Surprising things popping up all the time uh, that hadn't been observed before. And uh, so one key observation was the uh, stabilization. Form amidinium would be the, 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 the material of choice that has the best optical properties. But it's not stable at room temperature. It's only stable at that above 150 degrees. So when you take the room temperature, it will, it will spontaneously form the so-called delta phase. That is useless. It's yellow. <laughs> and so, uh, so, how do we, so we discovered that we can block that, which is adding a little bit of methyl ammonium. We can stabilize the, the perovskite black phase. And, uh, so this concept has not been applied previously in perovskite-based solar cells. That was a, a big winner because you know, there are so many competitors. It's very hard to publish a paper where you have an original finding because X other people publish at the same time. And the chances that you will be scooped, <laughs> as you say, are very, very high. So you better rush, get your papers out. And so, but this one was out and it's the first. So that's why I 
uh, it was, has a general importance for perovskite chemistry. And so, uh, yeah, so we now here are some of these methyl ammonia stabilized form of medanium system. See, they are lighter metals, and at the same time, they're also very good for the old tags, uh, close to 24%, and very simple, a solution process, they're all printed. And uh, so that's the, that's the big advantage. And of course, you, when you have a good photovoltaic, you should also have a good light emitter. These things are linked by thermodynamics, and uh, the reference is here from one of the graduate students of Melvin Calvin, the Nobel Prize winning scientist, discovered the Calvin cycle in photosynthesis. And so, yeah, we also mix, we work on uh, 2D, as, as I said, this is fascinating stuff. I mean, uh, column wells, excitonic features, phase mix, you can functionalize those uh, spacer molecules, you can uh, make a redox function, introduce redox function or light emitter. So this is a whole new area. It's, so it's justifiable that we have these many publications that appear. They all are very, very interesting, or most of them are. And uh, so here's some of our 2D systems, the elemental based. So, yeah, I, I won't be, uh, uh, I just want to wrap up the postcard by telling you that, I mean, not everything is, is done here. The stability still needs to be investigated. These are so complex, these systems, so we need to, we need to work on stability. Here we introduced the uh, inorganic hole, hole extraction layer that stabilized the, uh, the path guide, uh, except we had a problem with the back contact. We had to introduce graphene oxide, graphene oxide uh, as a flocking layer to uh, prevent this degradation reaction between the copper cyanide and the metal contact. So then we get really stable output, 1,000 hours, at six weeks, full sunlight at 60 degrees. That's one of the lacmus hacks you have to do with your solar cell. Maximum power point tracking, full light on it, 1,000 hours. And then you go to 85 degrees, and you repeat the whole thing. And if, if then you get less than 5% degradation, you can say, I have a pretty good stable system. I can go further, <laughs> OK? But if it degrades, you have more work to do. And so, yeah, so I have only two minutes left, so I will be uh, showing you some applications now. These are just some uh, commercial, mainly dye-sensitized systems in Korea, also in Korea, Windows. These are uh, uh, Japanese products. So a whole lot of uh, ambient light harvesting systems. This uh, uh, Fuji, look at this beautiful, this is a solar cell panel by Sony. And uh, these lamps are autark, you don't need any electricity. They capture ambient light and then at night you have a, a light for free. And there's also some electricity producing windows. And here's the Exeter, Exeter company in Sweden. They have 3,000 square meter next to the KTH. Who is that person here? You saw the picture yesterday. They just looked nicer. This is the Swedish king. <laughs> All the Nobel Prize people know it, they know him. <laughs> and so, uh, so here's the production, and they have products. First uh, products, Samsung is commercializing now this year. So you don't need a battery. They, they just take ambient light, and they sustain the electronic function with ambient light. And so they got big investments, 20 million from SoftBank, major Japanese company. We had a big celebration in the City Hall, Stockholm. And uh, uh, so Giovanni Fini, the CEO, that's my wife, and I had to put this uh, tails on, a real problem. So, uh, so and uh, then they got more money from the Swedish pension fund, so the company as well, the company is hiring. So if you guys are looking for a job, they're hiring engineers, uh, plenty of, of positions. And now finally I show you the, I'm really proud we're doing, showing our students how to make uh, solar cells. And uh, we just use the blackberries or tea, you can extract the anthocyanin dye by, uh, by just for a simple, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, contacting the, uh, the pulp with the uh, TI2 film. So TI2 gets colored, you make solo cell, and it works, 600 millivolts. So the, the winner, we always have a kind of competition. We used to give them a bottle of wine, but our president, uh, he objected. So now it's uh, chocolate, cis chocolate. <laughs> so here's the theory of the electron selective contact. So it's all these uh, anthocyanins, this has been also explained. And, uh, and so uh, we're going to younger age. And I should tell you that uh, when I was on the plane here to Singapore, I had just boarded the plane in Zurich. A captain comes to me. I mean, it's always the second time this happens. The captain comes and says, you must be Professor Gretzel. I said, yes. And then he said, well, I just want to say hello to you. I hope you feel well in our <laughs> the plane here. And uh, it's a pleasure to fly you to Singapore. I said, yeah, it's great that you do that for us. And I said, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm contacting you because my son, he made one of your solo cells in the school. <laughs> and so that's already the second time a, a pilot comes to me <laughs> and tells me that. <laughs> so it tells you that some of this is now being spread in the country. And yeah. So it's up, my time is up, so I, I, I'm just giving now the uh, credits to our school. We have, in Switzerland, have to ski. If you don't ski, you're not a human being. <laughs> I already skied this year, three days, okay? So, so and I uh, got some new carving skis. So we have our skiing day, and that's uh, a big event in the snow. Beautiful sky, beautiful nature. Let's work to conserve our beautiful world. Thank you. <laughs>